Thanks uh, Brother Leek and uh, Brother and Sisters, young people and those that are uh, joined with us uh, online. We've, we've covered a, a lot of ground, haven't we, uh, today? Um, we looked back at those very ancient battles in our first session and how they prefigure the events that we're expecting to see in the time of the end. We saw in the second session how the nations were aligning themselves together with the King of the North, ready to come down on the mountains of Israel. And uh, in the last session, we had a really good discussion on some of the motives, possible motives for the King of the North and the condition of Israel, uh, how she might be when uh, Go comes down. Now, in this session, what we're going to look at is um, more, look more forward to the establishment of the kingdom and how that doesn't happen instantaneously, but it takes a period of time for it to come to fruition. And then we're going to have a bit of a long run into the kingdom and then look at the final rebellion that happens at the end of the thousand years as well, because that is relevant to the king of the north, because um, we see a re-emergence at the end of the, of the kingdom period. Now, I think perhaps it might be worthwhile us asking the question, you know, why, why has God given us all this detail? Why do we have all of these, these prophecies revealed uh, to us? Well, we know that um, God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Now, we're familiar with that verse, aren't we, from, from Amos? Um, but I suggest it, it goes uh, deeper than this. Can you come with me, please, to um, the book of Revelation, chapter 19? And we, we're going to be spending quite a bit of time comparing um, some of the prophecies in uh, the book of Revelation and Ezekiel 39 in particular um, in, our, in this last session. And, and the context of Revelation 19 is the marriage supper of the Lamb. And uh, John and the brethren of the saints falling down at the feet of the angel that represents uh, the Lord Jesus. So let's pick it up in verse 10 of Revelation 19. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren, which have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And it's that phrase I'd like us just to just to think about just for a moment. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The word spirit, it's the idea of breath. It's the, it's the very breath of prophecy. It's the essence of prophecy. Well, what does it mean by, by testimony? Well, if we get a concordance out, um, the word testimony, it's uh, the word martyr. It means to witness. It's, it's the, the martyrdom of Jesus, the witness of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Well, what was the, the martyrdom, the witness of, of Jesus? Well, it's what he did, isn't it? It's when Jesus gave of his life as a sacrifice for our sins. It's the resurrection of, of the Lord Jesus. And what this verse is telling us is that that is the very essence of prophecy. And so in its widest sense, the reason why we have uh, prophecy it explains to us God's great plan and purpose with this earth, doesn't it? And that great plan and purpose with the earth is to eradicate sin and death from off this planet. That's what the spirit of prophecy is all about. So sometimes we can get a bit tied up, can't we, in dissecting the world political events and we can debate in great detail the intricacies of the prophecy of the king of the north and that's all beneficial to us but we need to remember the bigger picture that it's to do with the removal of sin and death from this planet and it's that, that change that great change from the kingdom of men to the kingdom of god so that the lord might be sanctified and that god might be known amongst all people um, on this planet and, and I think it's really important that we we remember that um, when we're looking at these things so how does this happen then this sanctification this magnification that God might be known amongst many nations well let's go to Daniel chapter 11 and just sort of build up a bit of a, a picture uh, for us and a springboard uh, into the establishment of the, of the kingdom. 
So we've debated about how the King of the North comes down into Egypt and then comes back up again uh, into the land of Israel. And we have in verse uh, 44, but tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. So when he's in Israel, he, sorry, when he's in Egypt, he hears something in the east and the north, so the area of, of Israel. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. But then we come to verse 45, and he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Now we know that between the seas, that's the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And we know that the glorious holy mountain, that of course is Mount Zion. It's Jerusalem that these things are focused upon. And we know that God greatly desires this mountain to be. Uh, Psalm 132 verse 13 says, For the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. So it's when Gog is in this place, in the glorious holy mountain in Mount Zion, and all nations come against Jerusalem to battle, that Jesus and the saints stand up and claim it as his throne. So Jerusalem isn't to be the throne of Gog, um, but of course Jerusalem is to be the throne of of the Lord and, and Jesus will establish God's kingdom from um, J- Jerusalem. So we know that that is the start. That's the, the seedbed, if you like, of the establishment of um, the kingdom. But sometimes I think we can think of the return of Jesus as a bit like a light switch, that Jesus returns and then the kingdom era uh, is upon us, that everything is going to be sorted, God's kingdom here, that, that, that's it. But that's not the case. It's a process that takes Time. I come with me to Matthew chapter 13, one of the parables of um, the Lord Jesus. Uh, Matthew chapter 13. There's a whole series of parables here, isn't there, that tells us what the kingdom is going to be like. Um, verse 31, we want to look at. Um, Matthew 13, verse 31 says, Another parable was he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, and indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree, so that birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. So it starts as a seed, it then germinates, it then has to grow, and it's only then that it becomes this great tree that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. And so this is the the kingdom of God described as a tree, as a mustard uh, that starts as a grain of mustard seed. And and there's a direct connection here back to Babylon. If you come back to uh, Daniel chapter four, just for a moment, remember that um, the empire of Babylon was likened in a very similar way. Uh, Daniel chapter four. And this was a vision, wasn't it? It was a dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. Uh, Verse 10 of Daniel chapter 4. Thus were the visions of my head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, the fruit thereof much. It was meat for all. The beasts of the field and the shadow end of it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. And then later on in this chapter, this tree is explained as the empire of Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar being the king of that empire. Now, we know that the the Babylonian tree had to be cut down, didn't it? It was uh, banded with an iron band and a brass band, descriptive of how the kingdoms of Greece and Rome would follow on. But the tree of the kingdom of men continues to this day. the events of Armageddon are going to fell that tree and then this is going to be replaced by the tree of the kingdom of God. But the growth of that tree is going to take time. Let's just see how, how that's going to, to develop. So let's go to um, Revelation chapter 19 and let's see if we can um, link some of the passages together and see a bit of a pattern uh, that emerges. <clears throat> 
So having been told that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, um, we then have the information as to how that's going to be brought about. So verse 11, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he does judge and make war. Now, very clearly, this is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's only the Lord Jesus Christ who is faithful and true. And he returns from heaven and he brings war and judgment. Verse 12, his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head many crowns. And he had the name written that no man knew but he uh, himself. So we know that fire, it's a symbol of judgment. So this is Jesus bringing judgment against an ungodly world. And he has a, a, a crown uh, with diadems um, suggesting conquests that have already been won. And Jesus has already won that greatest conquest over sin and death. And then we have a slightly unusual phrase. Um, he has a, a name written that no man knew but he himself. And then verse 13, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and the name is called the word of God. So told that only he knows the name but then we're told what the name is that he is called the word of God. Now um, to understand what this is referring to it's helpful just to go to the gospel of John and chapter 8. Um, just briefly go there just to pick out this little detail that uh, how could nobody knew the name and then the name's told. Us. Well John chapter 8 and uh, verse 55 says, yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Now, this word know here, there's two different words in the Greek. Um, the first word is ginosko, which means getting to know. And that's what we're all like. We're getting to know. Um, God. None of us fully know the plan and purpose of God. But, but Jesus does. And so the second word know here, but I know him and keep his saying, that's the word Edo, uh, which has the idea of complete understanding, full understanding and knowledge. And so when we come back to Revelation chapter 19, when it says that no man could know this name, no, what it really means is that no one has full understanding of this name, of what it is to be the word of God, other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think it's helpful for us all to remember that when we see through a glass darkly, don't we? We think we know the things that are going to happen, which revealed in God's word, but none of us has that full understanding, save the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is clothed with a vesture dipped in blood in verse 13 and it's through the blood of the everlasting covenant that we are saved <coughs> but whilst jesus takes the lead he of course is not alone uh, verse 14 and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen white and clean and out of his mouth proceeded a sharp sword that with it he should go and smite uh, the nations and rule them with a rod of iron. So there are, there are those in heaven um, that uh, are on the horses as well and clothed in, in fine linen. And these are, of course, the saints that are with the Lord Jesus. And when we stop and think about it, brothers and sisters, it's very sobering, isn't it? What we've been called to do, that having been baptised, we believe that we will be with the Lord Jesus when he returns, we'll be called to judgment, and then we are found worthy, then we will go out and fight with him. And the fight that we will bring to this world will be like nothing that's been seen before. That great earthquake that's going to shake the foundations of the kingdoms of men, it's going to be greater than the Earthquake in the time of Constantine, greater than the earthquake of the French Revolution. It's going to bring about this new world order, the like of which has never 
been seen. And so we have passages like Daniel 7, don't we? The kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom and the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting dominion. All dominion shall serve and obey. There's about extent, isn't there? The language here, the greatness of the kingdom and the whole heaven, that's what's going to be um, passed over. And there is the aspect of needing to go out and fight uh, with the Lord. So you'll know these words well. Psalm 149, let the high praise of God be in their mouth and the two-edged sword in their hand to execute upon them the judgment written. This honour have all the saints. And if you're anything like me, I don't feel very prepared to do that, uh, brothers and sisters. And we're thankful that our Lord and Master will lead the way for us. Verse 15, out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. Now, I'd like to remember that phrase, um, the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God, because we're going to come back to that um, a, a little later. But having established that it's Jesus and the saints that bring about these judgments, um, we then have language that we can link back to Ezekiel in um, chapter 19 of Revelation, verse 17, where it says, I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, small and great. Now, it's pretty horrible language, that, isn't it? The eating of the flesh of captains and mighty men and, and so forth. But it's the language of conquest, and it's the same language as we've got in Ezekiel. Let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 39. Because after Gog falls on the mountains of Israel... In verse 4, look at the language that we have. Verse 4 of Ezekiel 39. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands, and the people that is with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beasts of the field, to be devoured. It's very similar language, isn't it? It's the same language that David said to Goliath. Uh, David said to Goliath, this day will the Lord deliver me into thine hands and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistine this day and to the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. So this language is initially used of Gog and then it's repeated again but in more detail later on in the chapter. If you come down to verse 17 of Ezekiel 39, and thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl and to every beast of the field, assemble yourselves and come, gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice, that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that ye may eat flesh and drink blood. Ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the lambs and rams and lambs, sorry, of rams and lambs and of goats and of bullocks, all them fatlings of Bashan. Ye shall eat fat till ye be full. And if we put these uh, two passages, Ezekiel 39 verse 17 to 19 and Revelation 19 verse 17 to 18 side by side, you'll see that the language is very similar. So we need to ask the question, well, why is it repeated? Why is it firstly about Gog specifically and then why is it repeated again? in Ezekiel 39. Well, what this thinks is giving us, it's an insight into the initial battle of Armageddon, but then a number of battles that take place to bring about the period of peace in the kingdom. And I think we have a little insight into this in both Ezekiel and Revelation. So in Ezekiel 39 and the first five verses, we have the destruction of Gog on the mountains of Israel. And we've referred to it quite a few times uh, today. In Revelation, we have that battle of Armageddon, don't we? In Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15. 
Now in Ezekiel 39, and then in verse 6, we have something different. We said, oh, it says, I will send a fire on Mago, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Now, in our second session, we looked at where Mago was, didn't we? And we said that that was the area of Ukraine and that sort of um, part of Eastern Europe. Today, quite an extensive stretch of land. But it's also those that dwell carelessly in the isles. Do you remember back in Genesis chapter 10, the sons of uh, Japheth, it said that by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands. So the isles then, it's talking about the European um, nations. And we can link that with Revelation chapter 18, the destruction of of Babylon the Great, um, the European system and the destruction of the of the horn uh, of Revelation chapter 17. And there's the link with the fire, isn't there? Because it's a fire on Mago, and the fire is judgment. And you'll remember in Revelation chapter 18, when um, the shipmasters and those that trade, they see the smoke of her burning afar off and they weep and they wail for the destruction of Babylon uh, the Great. But it's also not just those specific European, um, the ba Babylon the Great that is humbled, um, but also the opposition to Gog is humbled as well. Um, let's go to, what we talked about it before, but let's just quickly go to Isaiah chapter two, keep a marker in Ezekiel. Um, Isaiah chapter two, let's not forget that Tarshish, Britain, uh, the young lions, that there's a humbling that happens there. And the passage in the Psalms was mentioned earlier today. Um, Isaiah 2, verse 11, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled, the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. So that's the principle. Verse 13, and upon all the cedars of Lebanon, high and lifted up and upon all the oaks of Bashan and upon all the high mountains upon all the hills that are lifted up and upon every high town upon every fenced wall verse 16 and upon all the ships of Tarshish and upon all pleasant pictures and the loftiness of men shall be bowed down the horses of men shall be made low and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day so it's the picture of the whole system of man coming crashing down because they've turned against God now, it's only when this has happened, and that may take a, a period of time, if we come back to Ezekiel chapter 39, we have a, we have a great crime. Um, verse 8 of Ezekiel 39, Behold, it is come, and it is done, saith the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken. Keep a marker in Ezekiel 39. Come over to Revelation chapter 16. The same language is used. So after the Battle of Armageddon, uh, Revelation 16. Uh, so verse 16, the gathered together to Armageddon. Verse 17, and the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. So there's that initial destruction and dominion that takes place. And I would suggest that this is the start of the rulership of Christ, that Gog and her allies are defeated. And so the when it is done cry is the moment that we have Christ on the throne in Jerusalem with the saints. But that's really just the start because there's still a huge amount of work that needs to take place. If you come back to Ezekiel chapter 39, there's a, a big clean-up clean up job to do. Um, so from verse 9 uh, to 16, we have the cleansing of the land. Um, and that's going to take a long time. Verse 9, and they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows, the arrows, the hand staves, the spears. They shall burn them with fire seven years. And we've seen the decimation in Ukraine, haven't we? Uh, over the last few weeks. Well, that's going to be nothing compared to what we'll see 
in Israel and how long that's going to take to clean up. And then later on in verse 12, we've got the burying of the dead uh, that's going to take seven months. Um, and not only is there a literal cleansing, but there's a spiritual cleansing as well, isn't there? There's a, and that's the eradication of the false worship that's in uh, Israel, the false way of thinking that's in Israel. And Prophet Zechariah and other prophecies as well uh, talk about similar things. But let's keep a marker in Ezekiel. Let's go back to Revelation 19, um, because the chapter starts with rejoicing. And I think we can perhaps link these things together. Revelation 19, verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia. Salvation and glory and honour and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants. And again, they said, Alleluia. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. So we've got these three cries of Alleluia. And perhaps we can link those three cries with the three phases, the destruction of Go, Armageddon, the destruction of the harlots, Revelation 17, the destruction of Babylon, Babylon the Great, and the fire in the land of Mago in Revelation uh, 18. So what happens next? Well, in Revelation chapter 19, we've got the detail of the marriage of the Lamb. Let's just have a look at this briefly. So verse 7 he says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Now, Brother Thomas and uh, some of the other uh, versions put this in the past tense. So I'll read the ESV for you, for example. Uh, ESV says, let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Now, if you're putting that in the past tense, that happens before we would suggest the destruction of Go, the harlot system, Babylon the Great, and so forth. And that's really interesting, isn't it? Because this makes sense in that we expect the initial union of Christ and his bride to take place at his return. But we know that the first thing that Jesus <coughs> does when he returns, it's not to fight against go, but it's to raise the dead. And then there's the judgment. And so whilst we look around and we can debate all the things that are happening in the world and so oh, this has got to happen and have we got the peace and safety yet in Israel? For us, Whilst it's interesting to look at it, it's actually not relevant because Jesus could return at any time to take us as his bride. Brother Thomas thought that we would not see go to take Turkey and uh, Istanbul, that we would be taken before them. And the emphasis on this verse is that the, the, the wife has made herself ready. That's the key, isn't it? She's been made ready. We won't turn to it, but Ephesians talks about the obedience of the, uh, the wife to the husband and likening it to our obedience that we should have to the Lord Jesus Christ. And how uh, Jesus desires to see in us the inward spiritual beauty, the beauty of the gold of faith and the patient waiting for him. But then we have a, a bit of a conundrum in, in this verse or these verses, because the bride having made herself ready um, and putting it in the past tense, it then says in verse eight, and to her was granted that it should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And then verse nine, he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb. And he saith unto me, these things are the true sayings of God. So then we have the marriage supper of the lamb. So does these things happen together or is there a uh, distance in time? Well, according to um, Younger's Bible Dictionary, 
Um, the custom of marriages in Bible times was somewhat different to what we have today, because our weddings are typically done over in a day, aren't they? Um, but in Bible times, they lasted a much longer period of time. So our younger says, by, the bridegroom, after putting on a festive dress, placed a handsome turban on his head and a nuptial crown, the bridegroom set forth from his house, accompanied by his groomsmen, <coughs> having reached the house of the bride, who with her maidens actually expected his arrival, he conducted the whole party back to his own or his father's house, with every demonstration of gladness, at the house a feast was prepared to which all the friends and neighbours were invited. The festivities were protracted for seven or even 14 days. So we have this initial union of the bride and the bridegroom, and then the bride's taken back to the bridegroom's house at a later date. Now, when we think of where our bridegroom's house is, where is the house of the Lord Jesus? Well, we know that Jesus is going to be in Jerusalem, isn't he? And if we come to Isaiah chapter 24, we've briefly touched on this with the, um, uh, when we looked at Melchizedek bringing forth bread and wine. Isaiah 24, um, sorry, Isaiah 25, um, we have the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, verse 6, Isaiah 25, verse 6. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make pe- feast of fat things, feast of wine on the leaves of fat things, for the marrow of wines on the leaves well refined. He will destroy in this mountain the covering cast over all people, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory. The Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away. So it's in this mountain that these things happen. So there's the marriage supper of the Lamb, feast of fat things, and there's also the granting of everlasting life in these verses. And the mountain is Mount Zion. We know that from chapter 4 and verse 23. The moon shall be confounded, the sun ashamed, and the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem before his ancients uh, gloriously. So there seems to be this gap then between this initial time of judgment and then this marriage supper of the Lamb. What else has got to happen? Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 14, and then we're going to put this all in a timeline and try and bring it all together if we can. So Revelation chapter 14 This is the chapter, which is sometimes termed the preaching of the everlasting gospel. So in other words, it's the events that bring about the establishment of the kingdom. If you come down to verse 6, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred, tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. So there's this opportunity for the peoples of the world to respond to the preaching of the gospel under the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints. And there's this time period given of an hour, which Brother Thomas suggests is 30 years. And the way he does that, he says that it's based on the lunar year, so 360 days in a lunar year, 12 hours of the day. Um, in how the Jewish uh, calculation works. So 360 divided by 12, that gives us the 30. Um, I think it fits. So we'll run, we'll run with that uh, explanation. You'll see why we think it fits in a minute. There's then in this chapter various warnings about not worshipping the beast. So um, the, well, Babylon the Great's fallen in verse 8. And then verse 9, the third angel followed them with a loud voice. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark on his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So there's still this false element in the earth. There's still this conflict uh, going on. And then there is this final judgment um, in verse 19, uh, or verse 17, and the, another angel came out of the temple, which is the heaven, he also having a sharp sickle, so sickle being the idea of judgment and threshing once again. Verse 19, and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the wine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Remember, we link that with Revelation chapter 19. 
And the wine press was trodden without the city and the blood came out of the wine press and to the horses' bridles by the space of a thousand six hundred furlongs. So again, Brother Thomas puts this as a 40 year period, 1600 furlongs, 40 times 40. And we'll see how that um, fit in a moment. So let's put all this, this together and let's have a look at our timeline. So we have the kingdom of men, which is the time that we're living in. And then Jesus is going to return to call those that are alive and to raise the dead. And those that are faithful, we have the marriage of the Lamb. And that will take a period of time, maybe 10 years or so. And then we have the events that we've been thinking about today, Armageddon, Babylon the Great destroyed, the whore destroyed, so there's fire in the land of Magog and so forth. And then after that, there is the marriage supper of the Lamb. So when Jesus and the saints are in Jerusalem and the granting of everlasting life. We then have this cleansing of the land, which we saw from Ezekiel. That's going to take some seven years and seven months. There's this preaching of the gospel, which circa 30 uh, years, and maybe there's some overlap between these uh, time periods, with, with an overall 40-year uh, period of sort of the public revealing, as it were, so 50 years to time with the Jubilee overall. And then we have um, some events at the end of this period. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 19, because there's still elements that have to be subdued. Revelation 19, verse 19 says, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with his flesh. And so we would suggest that this happens at the end of this Period. We might call it the Supper of the Great Gods, as it's termed uh, earlier on uh, in this chapter. And it's only at this point that God's kingdom is established, and that we then go into that thousand year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we're looking forward to, isn't it? We're looking forward to the kingdom. To be established but there's a lot that's got to happen before we get to there and we know that when that thousand year reign starts that we have this restraining of sin don't we we have the child dying a hundred years old we have uh, peace in the animal kingdom we have the wolf and the lamb dwelling together we have the poor and needy given true justice and righteous judgment and all the blessings of the kingdom age. So coming into Revelation chapter 20 then, and we're not going to spend too long on this, um, but it's interesting to see how it plays out. We have this restraining of sin, don't we, uh, for the thousand years. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 1, and I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand <coughs> years. And we know that it's the Lord Jesus Christ who has the keys of death and hell. And we have this restraining of the dragon. Um, Egypt is used as a symbol of the dragon. It speaks of opposition to God. It speaks of sin. And it's bound there for a thousand years. Verse 3, cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. After this, he must be loosed for a little season. So right at the end of the thousand years, we have this little season where sin and the dragon power and that is, is let loose again. and. Brother Thomas suggests that this little season is maybe a 50-year period, same as we've got this 50-year period at the start, before the establishment of the kingdom. Maybe there's a 50-year period at the end. 
And so what happens when this restraint has gone? Well, verse 7 of Revelation 20, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And so right at the end, we have this rebellion. And once more, Gog and Magog is mentioned. Uh, and I think it's helpful just to compare some of the details that we've got in Ezekiel 38 and Revelation 20, because some link these events being the same. Well, they're clearly not the same. Ezekiel 38 talks about many other nations, whereas in Revelation 20, we've just got Go and Mago mentioned. Ezekiel 38 talks of Go coming from the uttermost parts of the north, whereas in Revelation 20, it's from the four quarters of the earth. The, the size of the rebellion is similar. Uh, we've got a great company, many people, Ezekiel 38. And in Revelation 20, they're numbered as the sand of the sea. And it, it's really mind boggling, isn't it? The deceptiveness of human nature, that having had all of the blessings of the kingdom age, all of the opportunities to serve and to worship the Lord God, that there's this numbering as the sand of the sea that still rebels at the end. And that just shows you um, the nature that we all bear. In Ezekiel 38, it uh, comes against the mountains of Israel. Um, in Revelation 20, it comes against the beloved city, the camp of the saints. And there seems to be this withdrawal from the saints for a period of time from the city when Gog and Mago comes down. And we thought about the destruction of Gog in Ezekiel 38, earthquake, sword, great hailstones, pestilence, rain, fire. But in Revelation 20, it says that it's destroyed by fire from heaven. It's judgments from heaven that bring about the end of this rebellion. And so it's only after this little season that the dragon is loosed, Gog and Magog is destroyed by fire. And then finally, the devil and Satan is destroyed as well. Uh, verse 10 and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they shall be tormented day and night. And then there's the final resurrection at the end of the thousand years. And then right at the end in verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So finally, sin and death is eradicated. And we said at the start of our remarks that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And it's only at the end of the thousand years that we see the final outworking of that, that finally the work of the Lord Jesus Christ is complete. And it's then that we have the end, don't we? We have this wonderful picture into Revelation 21 of sin and death no more. <coughs> Verse 4 of Revelation 21, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And how wonderful that will be. And really, we've, we've got to finish with uh, words of Paul to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet, and when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God might be all and in all. And that is the finality, isn't it? That is the whole purpose that the scriptures lead us to. And it's amazing, isn't it, that God has revealed these things to us. And it's a real privilege that we can have an understanding of these things. 
So our time is, is so very short, isn't it? Um, it's been a hugely significant year so far. We were only in uh, April, uh, reshaping world politics. The angels have been hard at work. Uh, we see Russia flexing her muscles. We see Europe in turmoil. World events are moving so quickly. And Jesus could return at any moment. And so the challenge for all of us is to, to look forward, to make sure we're prepared, that we're ready for the return of Jesus, to make sure that we are prepared as his, his bride. The book of Revelation concludes, he which testifies these things says, surely I come quickly, amen, even so come Lord Jesus. Thank you very much for your time and patience today. Thank you.